Haggai this morning, <clears throat> and I think we have a great message for us. Look, look how the Word of God is so amazing to minister to us in, um, in this season. This, this time that we are presently living here, I think it's a great opportunity for us to learn from Haggai how he wants to encourage the people. And I believe the same encouragement applies to us. But first we have to see why he comes and he encourages the people. Why is it that they were discouraged? And so we're going to go basically to chapter 1 and chapter 2. I mean, we're going to finish the book of the Bible today. We're not going to do an in-depth study. But I want to just pick up some things here in the book of Haggai. And I believe, I believe it applies to us this morning in such a beautiful, powerful way. So before we do that, let's go, be, let's go before the Lord in prayer. So... So he will speak to us through Haggai. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you this morning. What a beautiful day this is. Lord, we are thankful for everything that you do. Father, we today want to pray for those um, families that um, gave a, a son or a daughter to be members of our military. Those that uh, gave their lives for us, for this country, for us to have this word, this amazing thing that it is freedom we remember the sacrifice that were the sacrifices that were made but we remember that sacrifice the most amazing sacrifice jesus when he came to die for our sins and to uh, give his life a ransom for many and we are free now because of that sacrifice and so we want to honor those who uh, um, wear a uniform those who are in the armed forces and those uh, that are servants public servants from our military, our local police, our firefighters, uh, medical personnel, our heroes these days, Lord. We want to pray for all of them. Lord, we want to thank you so much for what they have done for us. And Lord, we pray that in the name of Jesus, you will help us to remember uh, the families. Lord, um, Memorial Day is not a, a, a day off. Memorial Day for thousands, perhaps millions in this country is such a painful a very painful day. May we pray for those families. May we, we pray for that widow with their kids. May we pray for those fathers who are never going to see their sons again or daughters. And we, may we pray for all of them that made this country to be the great United States of America, one nation under God. And we thank you for that and we praise you lord and we ask lord that uh, as we open our bibles now that you will please speak to our hearts that you will guide us and lead us lord that you will teach us and and help us to apply this or, by the way not help us but you apply this truth to our personal lives as we together walk with you and we we're expecting to see great things you're going to do with us and through us here so blessed be your name we thank you and we praise you in jesus name amen so the book of Haggai, amazing book uh, because it has to do with people that are coming back from, remember, exile. They have been in Babylon for 70 years, and uh, they, they are going back to Israel. They're going back to Jerusalem. Many of these people uh, that are going back or they're coming back from Babylon to Jerusalem, they have never seen the country. They have never seen the city before. You might want to read uh, the book of Ezra, uh, because the, Ezra is the background where um, Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi, they, they, all three of these are prophets that are going to prophesy to the nation of Israel after the exile. And so in the midst of all of this, so the Lord, by his grace, because he's a gracious God, he says, OK, because you are a, a rebellious people, I am going to give you to be in captivity for 70 years. And the Lord says that he's going to bring them back to the to their land of Israel, to Jerusalem, basically. And as the, as the day comes for the 70 years of a captivity, the Lord is going to bring his people back. But you will find it amazing. Like That's why I said, read uh, Nehemiah and Ezra. You will, you will see the background. And it's just an amazing study if you do this. You, you will find out that, that there was a, probably more than a million people in Babylon in those days. 
And the Lord, by grace, uh, through Cyrus, the Lord says, okay, Cyrus, this is what you're going to do. You're going to release my people. You're going to provide everything so they can go back and rebuild my city. And, and, and so here comes Cyrus. And, and before he knows anything, he's mentioned in the scriptures. And perhaps Daniel mentions these things to him. And he puts this in writing. He says that the, the God of Israel is that God in the land. And so they are going back to Jerusalem. They're going to rebuild the city. And all of these things are great. And all of that, the day comes. And two men are going to be commissioned, if you will, to go back to Judah and, and, and to begin the, the rebuilding of the temple. And this is an amazing time. That's why I think this is a great message for us because uh, Haggai is going to, in four little messages, in a period of perhaps maybe four months, no more than that, in about four months, he's going to bring this prophecy and he's going to be addressing this prophecy to the leaders of Israel to the leaders of, that are supposed to take the people back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. These leaders are mentioned by name. One of them is Zerubbabel, and the other one is Joshua. And so here's Joshua, here's Zerubbabel, and they are going to be leading this great number of people. But by the way, it's been estimated that maybe 44,000, 46,000 people made their way back to uh, uh, Israel from Babylon. Most of the people that make their journey to Babylon. They decided not to come back. They wanted to stay there. They had a nice life. They were uh, progressing in business. They became very avid business people. And so they said, nah, you know, we just, we're just hanging out here. We're having a great time here. We don't want to go back. And then some people who never seen the city, never seen the country before, they said, oh, we'll, we'll go. And so there it is, maybe, if that, maybe 50,000 people out of a million and some, only 50,000 people wants, want, want to make the journey back to Jerusalem. And when they go back to Jerusalem, they see that, that the, the, the country, basically the city, is in ruins. It's, it's nothing but devastation and all of that. And, and, and because they, they heard how God was faithful and how the temple was beautiful. And remember, the temple was destroyed when Nebuchadnezzar comes in and in 586 and all of this devastation and all of these things that are happening. And some people are just eager to go and say, yeah, I want to go. The Lord is touching the lives of many. And so 50,000 people live that. They make their way back to Jerusalem. They begin the rebuilding of the temple. They're laying the foundation, the little foundation there. But then here comes trouble. Here come the Samaritans, and they said, hey, great to have you here. We want to help out. We want to work together with you guys in the rebuilding of the temple. And the people of Israel said, no, we've got not, no part in this thing. You're not even Israelites. No, get out of here, so we don't want to have nothing to do with you. And so here are the Samaritans who are not Israelites. Samaritans then write a letter to uh, uh, the, the king. They are, although they are free in Jerusalem, they are under the dominion of Persia. Now, remember that. So they write a letter to the king of Persia. And they said, hey, you know what? These Jewish people, these rebellious people, they're getting ready to rebel against you. If you don't do something with these rebellious people, they are going to not start paying taxes. They're going to do all these things. They're going to build a city. They're going to build a wall. Nothing, nothing like the truth. Nothing. And so what the, what the king Darius says, you know what? Stop the construction. I don't want anybody to do anything. No more. And guess what? In an amazing, <laughs> in an amazing uh, 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 time of just neglect, the people of Israel for 16 years stopped the construction, the building up of the temple. You will think that that was nonsense. That was a no-no. So for 16 years, nothing happens. And all the, all the while, things are getting worse. They start by doing okay, but then things are, the economy is declining. Uh, food is not as abundant as it was in the beginning. And so here's a group of people, ch check this out. Here's a group, a group of people humbled by their exile into Babylon. And now, before you know, now they're hopeful because they're returning to Jerusalem. But before that, they find themselves discouraged. A humble group of people, hopeful for their future. And before you know, they are discouraged because of the attacks of the enemy and all the obstacles in the rebuilding. So the work of the Lord stops for 16 years. And so here comes Haggai out of nowhere, and he's addressing the leaders, <laughs> the leaders of the nation, which happens to be Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest. And so check this out. 
chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came. I love that. Five times we're going to see that in the two chapters. But they are basically make, make up for four different messages. In a short period of time, like I said, four months. And there's amazing things that is going to happen here. The word of the Lord came. The date, August the 29, 520 B.C. That's an amazing thing because and, and, unlike other books, Haggai gives us straight dates and all of these things. So anyway, he says, The word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, check this out, the Lord of hosts, I, I want to ask you, highlight in those two chapters how many times he mentions the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts means the Lord of armies, the jefe, the one who's in control. Check this out. In just two chapters, how many times he mentions that, the Lord of hosts. And so he says here, the Lord of hosts says, these people, what people? The people of Israel. These people says, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be rebuilt. Verse 3, then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panel houses and this temple, this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, this, th therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Twice he's going to use the same phrase. Consider your ways. Three words. Consider your ways. This is our message for today. Consider your ways. Why am I saying this? Because you might find so many similarities. Nothing, nothing that the, it was not the purpose. It's not, it was nothing. It's, it's, this is just the word of God. And I want you to take it in as it is indeed the word of God. And check how he is going to deal with our hearts, deal with this condition that we're in. And how is going to encourage us? The whole point is this: to encourage us, to encourage us, people who find themselves, find, we find ourselves to be so discouraged. The message is going to be simple. He says, "Give God the supreme place in your life." This is the message. But he's going to say, "Begin by doing this one simple thing: consider your ways. Consider your ways." Is what the Lord says in verse 5. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Verse 6, you have sown so much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. Well, we definitely don't have a problem here because when we eat together, we do have enough. But do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but not not one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. This is the second time. What, what is he saying? This is what you, this is, he says, this is what you ought to be doing now. What's the scenario? Coming back to a place that was, lay, I mean, that was, that was devastated, that was decimated, a place that was completely destroyed. And they come with this one thing in mind. We are going to rebuild. Why do you want to go to Jerusalem? We're going to rebuild the city. And we're going to have a temple. Guess what? Once we have a temple, God is going to come and he's going to meet with us. This is what is behind this thing. It's not just to have a building. It's not just because, oh, the temple, the temple. No, 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 no. The temple was synonymous with God's presence and manifestation of his glory among his people. And so here they come. They find the place devastated, destroyed. So much destruction everywhere. They are eager. They are encouraged. They are excited about the work of God. They start working. They get the stones. They lay the little foundation that they're doing. And they're doing all these things. Somebody comes and he says, you're not supposed to be doing that. You got to get out of here. Stop the work. It's not for you to be here. And what do they do? For 16 years. They check out a quarantine of 16 years. And in the midst of that, the Lord comes in and he says, what are you doing? He says, who, me? He said, no, 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 not just all of you. You, the leaders, what are you doing? Dad, what are you doing? Mom, what are you doing? Well, uh, 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 no, 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 no. Consider your ways. Consider your ways. What are we supposed to do? 
What was the thing you were supposed to do from the beginning? Verse 8. Go up to the mountains. This is the people of Israel. There's nothing to do with you. You're amazing people. You never do these kind of things. If anybody looks kind of like these people, will be me, maybe Pastor Steve, Jeff, uh, us people here. But you guys, no, none of you. Don't, you don't qualify for this thing. You don't have these problems. Thank God. Go up to the mountains, he says. This is what you're supposed to be doing. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple. That's it. Build the temple. Well, but I build the temple. Why? <laughs> Simple, the Lord says. Build the temple. Why? That I might take pleasure in it and be what? Glorified, says who? Says the Lord. One of the reasons why we want to open up May 31st is because in all honesty, we respect authorities, we honor authorities, we abide by the rules and all the regulations and all of that kind of stuff. But when it comes to, to the glory of God, that's not non-negotiable. And for us, here at CCV, the glory of God is an essential. It's not just an extra. It is an essential. And that, that is not up to the president, it's not up to the governor, it's not up to the Supreme Court, it's not up to nobody to determine that worshiping God and, glory, and, and to glorify God is essential for us, period. Who says that? He says that. And if he says that, we believe that. And if we believe that, we abide by that. And we do that. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to come here. Now we're not following a movement. Trust me, we are not following a movement. I will never do that to you. Oh, we're going to do this because we're following a movement. Or because we're following a, a, a human leader. Or we, we, not, we will never do that. And if the day comes when I'm doing something like that, do me a favor. Kick me out of here and send me to, send, to sell peanuts at Angel Stadium or something like that. Because I have no business in ministry. The whole bottom line, people, why we want to do this is because the Lord says, You build the temple and I want to take pleasure in it. And I want to be glorified. That's the whole bottom line. Verse 9. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, it blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruin. Well, every one of you runs to his own house. Here's, here's the picture. There's no question. These were amazing people. I mean, can you see the excitement? Where are you going? We're going to Jerusalem. We're going to build the temple, man. Just like other men in the past. We are going to build the temple. The temple of the living God. Can you believe that? And now they find themselves doing what? Two things in life. That you, got, you, you have to. You want to be really careful. Two things in life. Either it's your full devotion to the God of the Bible. The living God. The one and only true living God. There's your full devotion to the true living God. Or there's the... Full devotion of self. Everything in life. Everything in life has to do with those, these two things. Whenever you find yourself. Whenever I find myself in these circumstances. He says, you look for much. But indeed it came to little. You're working, you're working, you're working. You're doing, you're selling, you're buying. You're doing all these things. And at the end of the day, it amounts to little. Then perhaps because your devotion to God is not in the right place. Perhaps because the devotion of self. And I tell you what. From Genesis to Revelation. The most uh, 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 horrible sin. It always has to do with devotion of self. That, 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 that ugly. That, that horrible thing that is called self. It's the one thing that gets in the middle of everything. And it messes up everything. It messes up everything. And so here's the people of Israel. They're coming back to the promised land. They are going to rebuild this, the, the temple. When they, when they get going, they're all excited. But then all of a sudden, self jumps in. No, no, wait, wait. It wasn't self. It was the Samaritans. No, it was self. Why? Because before that, when they were attacked by other nations, they were willing to go and fight with these nations. With the entire nations. And many, thousands of people died. But they were not willing to give, give themselves to self. And so here's the bottom line of everything. Haggai comes in the midst of a time when they were, everybody was supposed to be busy building and all doing all these things. And he says, hello, leaders of the city, leaders of the nation. You have a big problem. What's the problem? The problem is self. You're giving in to self and you have departed. Listen, 
you are neglecting the work of God because of self. Oh, that's horrible. Yep. So here's the thing. Were they not good people? Yes. Were they not great people? Yes. Were they not believers? Yes. Were they not people of faith? Absolutely. Definitely. They were people of faith. They have never seen the city, yet they wanted to go and rebuild the temple. It takes a lot of faith to do that. But even though they were people of faith, when self gets in the middle, they are immediately distracted from the main point and the most important thing. Second thing, second thing. First, the worship or the devotion to self. Second thing, they are being disciplined. They are being disciplined and they don't even know it. How do I know that? Check this out. But indeed, it says, you look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I, the Lord says, I think I read it wrong before. And when you brought it home, the Lord says, I blew it away. Why? Says the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to your own house. Therefore, the heavens above, therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I, the Lord says, call for a drought on the land, and the mountains, and the grain, and the new wine, and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth of men and livestock, and in all of the labor of your hands. You see what? The Lord is disciplining his people, and they don't even know it. They're working much. They are bringing in little. And whatever little they bring, the Lord says, he blows on it, and it, is, it just scatters all over the place. It amounts to nothing. They look to the harvest, and there's not much. They look for food, there's not much. They look for wine, there's not much. There's not much oil. And whatever the ground brings forth of men and livestock and all of the labor of your hands. And in other words, whatever you do in the commitment and devotion of self is going to amount to nothing. Number three. First, first remember. First, where is your devotion? Is your devotion fully committed to the Lord himself or is the devotion of self? Number two, what's going on with that discipline in your life? <laughs> What's going on? Well, sometimes things are happening. You know, but that happens. No, 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 no. Whenever there's a little bit of discipline, it must be because you're doing something wrong. How do I know I'm doing something wrong? Well, what's going on in your life right now? Well, you know, we've been struggling with this. We're struggling with that. And well, has it ever circled around your mind that you might be disciplined? You might be going under some discipline? <laughs> Again, nothing to do with you. I'm talking about the church now, the church in general. Could it be that God in his grace says, hey, no, 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 time out, time out, time out. My church is nothing but just a bunch of, you know, uh, 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 shows and a bunch of drama and a bunch of uh, nonsense. I need to stop these things. How many times you and I, we quote, oh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, my people were going by... Read verse 13 before we quote that verse. Because in verse 13 says the Lord, I did it. All this calamity, I brought it upon you. All the pestilence, the Lord says, I brought it upon you. All this, you know, lack of everything, he says, the Lord says, I brought it upon you. Why? He says, so that if you repent and pray. We like to hear God who is ready to just forgive everything. No, 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 no. Discipline, discipline comes before devotion goes up. No, but it's not discipline. It's not, no, 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 no. For the world, it might be whatever you want to call it. But for you and I, the children of God, God will never put you and me to go through something like this without a plan and a purpose for it. I know the plans that I have for you, the Lord says. I know the plans that I have for you, the Lord says, to give you a future and uh, what? And why is it that he says to give you a future? It's because the present is not right. And the Lord is withholding all of these things. The Lord is calling his people and is disciplining his people because they needed to get it right. And it starts with who? It starts with you, dad. It starts with you, the leader. It starts with us, pastors. 
Verse 12, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shaltiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshadah, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people. What do they do? Check this out, please. Check this out. That's probably the most important word in those verses. Zerubbabel and Joshua, who happens to be the high priest, they did one thing right after it says, and the remnant of the people, comma, what is it? Obey the voice of the Lord their God. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So what's the point here? Well, we're going to read to the, to the end of the chapter in chapter 2. We're going to see how the Lord says, <laughs> I am with you. When did he say that? First, when they hear the word of the Lord, when they take in the word of the Lord, when they obey the word of the Lord, when they consider their ways, they stop everything. Consider your ways means stop everything. Let go of everything. Let it go. Just drop it. Let it go. Just let it go. Pay attention. Open your eyes. And hear, listen to what the Lord has to say. Because he says here clearly, I'm not making this up. It was when all the people, because the leaders are taking them there, when they obey the voice of the Lord their God and the words of the Haggai, of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God has sent him, and the people, what? Fear the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. <laughs> I'm looking forward to next Sunday. And I want you to remember these words. Now, it will be foolish for us to make our way here. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I don't just want to entertain a, a number of people. Pastor Steve, Pastor Jeff, and myself, we've been examining our ways. We have been considering our ways. And one thing I told these guys the other day, I said, listen. I must rather submit a letter of resignation if what it's going to take to be the pastor of this church means that I have to entertain people. I'll go somewhere else. And I do anything else. But I am not going to be entertaining people who want to be just comfortable. I am not going to be entertaining people who want to just have a great time. I'm not going to be entertaining people who want to have kickback. I want to believe that God is going to use this time, that our God has been using this time to make us all obey, to teach us all to obey, because I want to hear my God loud and clear said to me, I am with you. And I want for us here at the church to hear all of us together coming next Sunday, that the Lord will speak loud and clear to us. Have you considered your ways? Yes, Lord. What have you got out of this whole thing? Lord, we got out of this thing that we have put self in the place that belongs to you. We have given ourselves to worship self, not the living God. And... And as a consequence of our rebellion and our disobedience, Lord, we find ourselves in lacking of everything. And Lord, we don't ever want to go that way again. Hear the message of the Lord. I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord, verse 14, stir up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked in the house of the Lord, of hosts their God. And on the 20th, fourth day of the sixth month, in the second year of King Darius, in the seventh month of the 21st, of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai to prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who, has, who saw this temple in, the former, in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes as nothing? <laughs> If you walk in here with the place empty right now, you will go like, oh, I, actually, we had people that came in 
just during the week, and they walk in here, and they walk out of here weeping. When they've seen that we have removed most of the chairs here, they got out of here weeping. And some people came in here just to pray and to see this place, and they're like, oh, why did this happen? How did we ever get so far away from the Lord? Well, because of this. Is this not in your eyes? There's nothing? <laughs> Verse 4. Are we okay? Are you having a good time? Take a deep breath. It gets better. But the, the, I remember young person used to say, the sword goes in, the dirt comes out. The sword goes in. But you know, in his particular way of saying, oh, oh, oh. no, I, don't, I, I cannot do that. But it's okay. It's okay. Sometimes the sword needs to go in and in and in and in and in and in and then deep and deeper, deep and deeper. Because the deeper it goes, you'll, you'll be amazed that the deeper the sword of God goes in, you will find dirt in the deepest part of your heart. Well, not you again. I'm sorry. Not you. You're great people. I, I get all the dirt for you. So, so the Lord says, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Verse 4. Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and be strong, all of you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord. Oh, oh that's what I want to hear here. Oh, you know, we, we're praying for people to come and say, Lord Jesus, here we are. We are your people. We take it. We get it. Never again will our devotion be to anything, nothing else than you, Lord. We will not compromise in our walks with you no more. We will worship you. We will praise you, Lord. We will serve you. Lord, we will just be your people as long as you want to be our God. And you will never leave us, never forsake us. God, we are so thirsty for your presence and the living water that comes from your spirit. We're so passionate about you, Lord Jesus. Verse 5, according to the word that I covenant with you when you came out of Egypt. The Lord says, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this because I'm faithful to my promise. You don't deserve it. You don't earn it. You, you don't do nothing. The Lord says, yet I am with you and I am going to bless you. Because this is according to my word, the Lord says. Notice verse 5 again. According to the word what I covenant with you when you came out of Egypt. So here's the beautiful part. So my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. So my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Verse 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts. Once more, it is a little while, just a little while, he says, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land. Can we take that seriously? Can we consider our ways and listen to that? The Lord says, for once again, I want to believe that once again, the Lord is saying this to us. I want to take this as, it is a word straight from the Lord to us. The Lord says, get back in there, my people. I am with you, my spirit. My spirit remains among you. Awesome, Lord, you're amazing. But the Lord says, but keep in mind, it's just going to be for a little while. Isn't that amazing? I will shake heaven and earth and sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations, and they shall come to the desirable nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Now you realize that that's not limited to you or me or anybody doing anything. The Lord is not under the obligation to no one. The Lord says, I will do this. I will fill this temple. 
And it happened when Jesus came. Of course, you know that there's, there's a fulfilled prophecy there because Jesus comes to the temple and he, the greater glory of that temple was greater than the glory before because Jesus himself, Messiah, was in the temple. Yet when he was in the temple, what did they do? They kicked him out. And they got so, so tired of Jesus exposing their, 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 their fake adoration and all the things that they did just as a tradition and religious practices, they got so tired when Jesus says, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. What to you? What to you? And it, it, over and over and over and over. They finally got tired and said, well, let's, we just got to kill this man. And they did. And I wonder how many times we pushed the Lord out of this little temple. And we didn't say, get out of here, Lord. We didn't kick them out of here. We didn't force them out of here. And I wonder if the Lord found us and have seen this place of worship here. And as the Lord comes here, I wonder if the Lord really is delighted to be sitting in the midst of us. I wonder if the Lord really did enjoy worshiping with us. I wonder if the Lord have, uh, for, for years really rejoiced being in our midst because we're worshiping him. Because he knows our hearts. I wonder how many times the Lord said to us, oh, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, says the Lord. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord. What do you think you can give me, says the Lord of hosts? The glory of the latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace. I mean, seriously, you got to read it. You have to read the whole thing again and again and again and again. Read it a hundred times and read it and then over again. There's, there's just so much in here. And you might be thinking, well, yeah, that was for them, not for us. Yeah, you're taking it out of context. No, 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 no. The other day we were in a conference with so many pastors around here. I mean, really, not just around here, but in the, all, the whole nation. And, and there's a group of lawyers that are doing everything to help us and all of that. And, uh, you know, giving us legal advice and all of that. And, and seriously, one of the pastors, uh, that I'm not going to never mention his name. Here, I mean, here you have close to 2,000 pastors, and all of them are asking. They're, they said, you send us your, your questions, and all of them asking, like, is it okay to bring children to the service? Is it, everybody is asking about the, the, the possibility of doing little things here and there within the legal context of these things. And this one pastor, who I happen to know really well, and he was the only that foolishly posted this thing. Well, we don't need to open the temple because we are the temple. Seriously, I wanted to kick the TV. Because they have your name on that thing. Imagine if all of these people are watching these things. And I go like, seriously? Seriously? No, we don't want to open a temple just because we want to open a temple. We want to open a temple so that God can come and he, and he find himself having pleasure among us. And that he can find himself worship and praise by his people. He delights to do that. And by the way, when you worship, when you praise him, it's not out of you. The Lord says, the Lord stir up the hearts of the leaders, uh, 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 Joshua and Zerubbabel. That says, the Lord stir up the hearts of the leaders, Zerubbabel and Joshua. And the Lord stir up the heart of all the people. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of their eyes, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. Now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, If anyone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge of edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil, or any food, would it become holy? Then the priest answered and said, No. The meaning, because you're holy, you don't make other people holy. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And Haggai says in verse 13, If one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it be unclean? So the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. So meaning, be careful. Because your holiness, you cannot transfer that to other people. But your unrighteousness easily hurts people around you. That's what he's saying. And notice, he's dealing with the leaders of the, of, of, of the nation here. 
So then Haggai answered and said, verse 14, uh, I don't even know what time I'm supposed to stop. I think Pastor Steve is going like this, but can you just give me five minutes? I'll be done in five minutes. Then Haggai, Haggai answered and said, So is this people and so is the nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. Uh-huh. Sounds familiar? Yep. Very familiar. Verse 15. And now, carefully consider from this day forward. Now, let me tell you something. On verse 10, you know verse 10 says, On the twentieth, fourth day of the ninth month, in the second year of their eyes, the word of the Lord came to Agha the prophet. You know, that day, that the, the tenth of that month was the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month. So it will be December. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Ay, ay, ay. You do the mathematics. December 18, 520 BC. That will be the date right here. The Lord says, so from this day, on that day. And now if you do that, if you take December 18, 520 BC, and you go 2,500, 200, 2,500, 200 days back, guess what? You go all the way back. Remember, the calendar used to be 360 days. So if you take 25,200 <laughs> 25, days, actually, 25,200 days, if you go back all the way, guess what it is? It falls right on the day when the b devastation of the people of Israel began. And that day, when it says here on the 20th, fourth day of the ninth month, that will be exactly 70 years, 70 years of devastation. The Lord is so amazing. He says, on this day, what day? Think about this day and write it down, he says. I want this day to be remembered. Like, oh, today is the day. Today is the day of the 70th year of our devastation. And notice what the Lord says. Isn't that amazing? We're going to close with this. And now carefully consider from this day forward and before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days when one came to a heap of 20 ephahs, there were but then 10. Then one came to the wine Bat to draw off 50 bats from the press, but there were 20. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail in all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. It's the Lord says, so who did it? The Lord says, I did. Who did all this to us, Lord? Was it China? Was it this? The Lord says, I did. I don't, think he, I don't think he wants us to miss this. He didn't create this mess. But you understand what he's saying to us. So what, what's going on here? The Lord says, I just want to have your full attention. Can I do that? No, uh, definitely. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. Consider, verse 18, consider from now from this day forward. <laughs> Stop, listen, pay attention. From now on. From the 20th, fourth day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. it is, the seed, is the seed still in the barn? Yes. As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day, I will bless you. I will bless you. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots. And those who ride in them, the horses and the riders shall come down, everyone who... Everyone by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant. The son shall till, says the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. I think you will agree with me. It's an amazing message in these two chapters here. Again, I regret that I didn't have more, more time to go over so many details in here. But just an amazing, amazing, amazing book here with a very simple, practical way to apply this truth to our lives. Here's the most amazing thing. If you take the two chapters and the many mentions of, of uh, Haggai saying the Lord spoke to me or the Lord spoke through him and all of that. 
He will be the one prophet in the whole Bible that spoke more of God in relative numbers. Spoke more of God than any other prophet in the Bible. Another thing that is amazing. He speaks to the leaders. And guess what? The leaders do pay attention. And with the leaders, the whole people of Israel, they do pay attention. And they follow. They obey. And when they said, we're going to pay. The Lord says, and I will bless you. They said, we will work. The Lord said, and I will be with you. And, then, and they said, well, Lord, but you will have to protect us. The Lord says, I will shake all the nations. If it means that I will protect you because I love you, because I have placed my seal upon you. Check that out. I will shake all the nations and the kings. He says, bad news for our governor here. <laughs> I'll mess around with God's people. But here's the message, people. Give God number one priority in your life. Don't fall for that trick thing that you ought to be worshiping self, that you're working for you, that you're building your own little kingdom. See, the greatest privilege of all Christians is to expand the kingdom of God here on earth. The greatest privilege of all Christians is to be expanding the kingdom of God here on earth. If whatever years you spend building your own little kingdom, guess what? At the end, you're going to lose it. Let me say that again clearly. If you don't give yourself fully committed to expanding the kingdom of God here on earth, whatever you do for you and for the worship of self, you're going to end up losing everything. Not something, you're going to lose everything. But whatever you build here for his kingdom, whatever you do for his kingdom, you will have an amazing, amazing reward in heaven. And this comes in the form of some words that you will want to hear, I want to hear. And it will be clearly said to you, well done. Well done. You want to be a faithful servant, though. You want to take into consideration. Give God the, the, the top priority in your life. And let him tell you in exchange or in return, actually. Tell him, make a commitment, and that's a commitment for us, the church. Next Sunday, I'm going to be challenging all of you that will be here for first and second service and all of you, that we are going together. We're going to stop somehow in the midst of, I don't know how we're going to do it. The Holy Spirit will have to lead us, but we're going to stop, and whoever is here, collectively, we're going to take a minute or two minutes or whatever time. We're going to go before the Lord, and we're going to say, Lord, there's one thing that we want to all ask you here collectively, corporately as a church. We want to hear you say, I am with you, and I will bless you. And that's really what we want to see happening out of this thing. If we can only say that after all this quarantine and all this nonsense and all these crazy things and all of that kind of stuff, that we, that we got simply these powerful things, that we will now obey the Lord and that we want to hear the Lord says, I am with you, and I will bless you, we will go for it. Amen? God bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord watch over you. Remember, Jesus said it best than anything. And if you want to remember these two books in, in a simple, simple, simple message, remember Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added on to you. May the Lord watch over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you. We thank you so much for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that you speak loud and clear to us, your children. We thank you, Lord, that you allow us to read and to learn from uh, people that went before us. And sometimes we learn from their mistakes, and sometimes we learn from their uh, apathy and their lack of interest, their lack of commitment. And when we read these things and we see the consequences of that such disobedience and rebellion, and then we bring it to our hearts, and in all seriousness, we just want to commit ourselves to you, knowing that God... If you don't do this, we are not able to do any, of, any good of this. And if God, if you are with your people, and God, if you are with us here, we know that for sure you want to bless us. But first, we have to build a place. We have to build in our hearts this altar where we are going to worship you sovereignly, where you are number one and the most important thing in our lives. Take us away from the desires of our hearts that drag us down to the desires of our flesh and the world and the temptations and all of these things. And make us to be a people, Lord, that, is, uh, that we are so eager just to worship you. To come here and to do everything we, we do here so that at the end of the day when we go home we can say, Oh, it so pleases the Lord to see all of us in unity of spirit, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. And that's why we are here. 
And we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. We'll see you next Sunday.